Senator Mikulski, what a treat to be with you today. Uh, I'm Koki Roberts, as you know, and we're here to, to talk for the students and, and others at uh, New York University. But um, you have a wonderful story to tell as the longest serving woman in the history of the United States Senate. Uh, but it started a long time before you came to the Senate, it started as an as a activist in Baltimore. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yes, actually my background is that of a social worker. I was a foster care worker for Catholic Charities, a child abuse worker, and went to graduate school because uh, during uh, the uh, time of the war on poverty and um, saw myself as really working to change communities and change lives, which I'm doing now. Um, but they were going to put a 16-lane highway through the older European ethnic communities and the first black home ownership neighborhood uh, in Baltimore. And I organized the Hell No, uh, We Won't Go uh, group. And uh, that took me into knocking on doors at City Hall when the doors weren't open. I decided to run for office and knock down those doors and open them for other people. And that's how I got into politics. But you also built coalitions at that time. And it seems to me that that's something you've been doing ever since. Yes, I've built uh, coalitions um, because, you know, when people look at someone who holds public office, they think you're a singular person, you know, that you walk the beach by yourself and <laughs> ponder big thoughts. First of all, it's grassroots organizing. It's trying to find other people who feel the mutual need, putting together a group, and out of that comes mutual respect, and then see how we can really show that the power of the many uh, can overcome the power of the few. And it was a community when we were fighting the highway. It was uh, right after the Baltimore uh, riots. Uh, people said, you will never get black and white people together. But you know what? For when people are going to fight for their home, their neighborhood, not have to live under a highway, you know, the, the big boys were telling us we could be happy they were going to give us a daycare center. <laughs> I said, we will die of exhaust fumes. Um, then out of that, because we saw mutual need, came mutual respect and even ultimately mutual uh, affection. And this is what coalition politics are, finding like-minded people. And they're often strategic alliances. You know, your friend today uh, might not be your friend forever, but it's how you get done. You know, my well, father used to always say, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. Well, yeah, that's a slogan also that has come out of many of the civil rights organizations. But you know, Koki, also, when you look at the women in the Senate, many of us didn't come from that traditional, uh, I'm in the law firm, I'm going to run for office. Many of us uh, got into politics because we were community activists. My friend Maria Cantwell of um, uh, Washington State got into politics because her community needed a library, and she wanted to open that door. Senator Patty Murray went down as a mother uh, to the Washington State Legislature for more preschool uh, programs, was ridiculed and said, oh, you're a mom in tennis shoes. Well, she laced them up and ran for <laughs> office. So many of us get into politics because of a community-based issue where we're both organizing and building the coalitions and then working then towards reform. But you've, you've talked about the felt need, uh, that it's something that people feel <coughs> in the community, uh, but it has to come from the bottom up, that it can't come from the top down. I believe that change always comes from the bottom up. What I feel is that some of my best ideas in terms of legislation have come from the people themselves. It's great to use experts, and it's wonderful to get ideas from think tanks, but often it is the energy of the people who feel that need. And often locally, it's for something at their school or at their library, but then you have to show it's a larger city issue, mm -hmm. and then it's a larger state issue. And where in the heck is the federal government? You know, In that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the path that you're describing really is a, a much more common one for women than for men to come into public office, the one of, of being active in the community. So, something, something got them activated, uh, and, then, and then they realized that the way they could affect it most was to run. Yes. And um, do you think that people understand that now, that you really, if you really want to make change in people's lives, the place to do it is in public office? 
I think that for our young people, because uh, I'm very passionate now about involving this next generation, mm -hmm. uh, and many of our young people are highly idealistic, but they see doing something but don't see the public um, policy implication. So there will be many people who will race for the cure. I think that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know about cancer and your family and, and so many others, but they don't say, okay, I'm racing for the cure today, but why, how do I get involved in doubling the funding at NIH? Right. And how about electing more women? Because in 1992, when we got more women and we've been getting every, more ever since, we tripled the funding of NIH because we were here, we made sure it happened. And we need to show that link between an individual action for philanthropy, which I really support. Of course. I want people to do that. But when you're working to build homes for Habitat for Humanity, why don't we have more affordable housing? So build that house with your small business or your company and donate your time or be a sweat equity person, but also say, well, why do we have a housing problem? Right. What's the public or, policy yes, here? What, yes, and, and how do I also change that? So it's not either or, right. it's a yes and. And also, you cannot solve this by simply Googling. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you have Another, to hear it from right. people well, and then I'm go out and do it. I'm a big believer in social media and communicating and the organizing. Really, for me as an organizer, wonderful new techniques. However, you just can't Google your way into solutions. You have to get involved and either run yourself or support those candidates that do. And you have to listen. Well, it always starts with listening. You don't know about that felt need right. until you listen to that need. Haven't you also found, uh, because I've, I've heard many of the women in Congress talk about this, that, that people come to the women in Congress more with their needs than they do to the men, that they feel an accessibility that they don't necessarily feel with male members of Congress? Yes, and it's also true uh, of women in the executive branch. We get a tremendous number of constituent requests. And often, when I was the only Democratic woman here, and there was only one other woman senator, Senator Kassenbaum of Kansas, we got letters from all over the country, often from women, about an issue like, my father needs a nursing home, I don't know how to pay for it, or um, I, I can't get my child support. And then one night, we also, as part of our dinners, which I'd like to yeah, talk, about, talk about, uh, we also had dinner with the women of the Supreme Court, then it was Ruth Ginsburg and uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. We didn't talk about cases, we just talked about our lives. But they get letters, dear mm -hmm. Ruth, mm -hmm. you know, dear M Ms. O'Connor, about the needs of things like child support, I don't know where to get a divorce, I'm a victim of domestic violence, we get this. And I think it's that one, we tend to be known by our first names, uh -huh. you know? right. Um, Men are known as Mr. So-and-so. <laughs> Women are known as, like, you know, Hillary, Condi, Madeline, uh, Barb. Um, and I think people feel a personal connection with us. I also think people think we will understand the personal issues and the political solutions that need to happen. And um, I think that's why uh, people reach out to us. You know, we say we work on the macro issues, and we do budget, tax policy, war and peace, but we work on the macaroni and cheese issues. <laughs> no, it's always, I always say this is a place where you can make enormous change both at the micro and the macro level, yes. and, and most people really don't realize how true that is. And you've, you've taken things like spousal uh, anti-impoverishment and, and uh, IRAs, uh, homemaker IRAs, and things where you have heard these these uh, concerns and worked on those with people from the other side of the aisle. Yes, I'll take the issue of uh, an IRA and uh, a, a woman who chooses or a spouse chooses to be full-time at home with their family. I believe that if your work at home is work. No kidding. Uh, <laughs> back uh, in uh, a few years ago, the contribution for a woman to an IRA was $500, where if you were working in a law firm or a community college, 
uh, you could contribute to $2,000. Well, it's your money. Right. And actually, I was approached by Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson, a Republican from Texas, to change that and just have equity that if it's your money, you could give the same whether you worked in the home or you worked in the marketplace. Well, this is interesting because her staff said, ew, ew, <laughs> why are you working with a liberal Democrat? You know what Mikulski is. And my staff said, oh, <laughs> what are you working with Kay Bailey Hutchinson? She's a Republican from Texas, and we know how they are. I said, well, you know, I really don't know how they are. She's the first one I've met, and she reached out to me. So we started to work together, and we found we really wanted to help with the economics of being a woman. And also, particularly we were concerned about women in their old age. So many women are impoverished exactly because they chose homemaker roles. We worked and we said, we got to strategize. We went out to dinner. Well, a glass of wine, some discussion on amendments. We had the best time. Lots of laughs, lots of good ideas. And we said, you know, this is so much fun. Why don't we get the other women together and just have a dinner? No agenda. We're not a caucus. We, we have different views on economic solutions and so on. That's when Kay Bailey and I put the group together. For then, it was less than nine of us. And that became the famous dinners of the women in the Senate. And they have lasted now more than 15 years. So, you know, the men are, are, are so nervous about your dinners because they're convinced that you're talking about them, which is kind of egotistical of them. Yes. Um, because, of course, you're not. You're there. Who's worth it? Um, but um, but I, I understand that not only do you have a good time together and is it nice to just be together, but that you actually can get some things done there. Yes, well, first of all, you know, we're, we're building... What comes out of this, again, we're not a caucus, but we say we are a force. If we can identify common ground, we then go for it. So in our conversations, we realized that we were all committed to the issue of women's health. Now, some of us might be different on pro-choice or not, but we were all absolutely adamant about really helping NIH in terms of issues affecting women particularly breast cancer funding and uh, a few other gender-specific, and that also we were looking at bringing also women who were talented who wanted to go to graduate school or medical school, in other words, increasing the pipeline. So we went to work on that, and we've made enormous changes and advances because of it. Uh, that's one area. But the other issue, we've also looked at women abroad and women and girls, and really now how do we fund those programs to be sure that every girl in the world can get an education and we'll help them be able to achieve it. So we've worked on those, but the other thing is where we don't agree, where we might agree on a goal, but not the method. We've said, we'll duke it out, but we're gonna have a zone of civility. We're gonna have a zone of civility. So in paycheck equity, equal pay for equal women, I brought a bill to the floor and Senator Hutchinson agreed with my goal, but she had nine amendments that were different than mine. She had a very different methodology. We debated, we duked it out, and at the end of the day, when the bill was over, and the bill did pass, some of it amended, some of it not, people said it was so much fun watching us. It was smart, it was edifying. There was no demonizing, there was no attacking. There were no snarky slurs. It was intellectual, inspirational, and guess what? The job got done. Well, that's what we want to show, that politics doesn't have to be nasty and personal. And when the day was over, we went out and had that other glass of wine and thought, how are we going to deal with the House and Conference? Which used to be the way it was uh, among the men, much more so than, than um, certainly much more so than it is now. Um, and, and you women really are the only ones who seem to be able to do that. Well, one is that we try to, to follow the zone of civility. But the other thing, I just to give a broader observation in addition to our dinners and so on, is that when I 
the, the, came to the Senate and also what the Constitution says is that we're supposed to represent states. We have philosophies, but now we're being dominated by people who feel they have to represent ideologies mm -hmm. and quite frankly be ideologically rigid, whether you're from the right, which has been very dominant in this, or from the left. That is very hard to achieve uh, really compromise on this. Um, I believe that, you see, I think in politics you can compromise on an issue but not capitulate on your principles. Right. You can keep your principles. Um, and I'm very concerned about this because our politics is deteriorating where we can't get anything done right. and there's no room for compromise. But, but you, it is different among the women. I mean, you, you seem to be, and we, we certainly see some data to this effect in state legislatures, for instance, more pragmatic, more eager to get, some, get the job done than to stand in your corners and yell at each other. Well, I'm going to give some ideas on why I think that's so. Number one, let's listen. And let's listen to both the people. Always you start with the people. But then let's listen to each other. And then how about not being judgmental? In other words, are you a good person or a bad mm -hmm. person? Yes, make your evaluations. Of course, you have to make a judgment on an amendment in terms of its efficacy or whatever. But we tend to judge people. Mm -hmm. When we had to move the appropriations bill, and I reached out to, to the House, um, we showed that we wanted to come over. When I called up uh, Congressman Hal Rogers, a, conser a very conservative man from Kentucky. And I knew that the House always thinks that senators are so pompous <laughs> and that we will never come over to the House. And if we come, we have to bring, you know, 15 staff and 30 TV right. cameras. So you're, you're talking, so we can explain this to me, but you're talking about physically going to the House side of the Capitol. Oh, yes. Oh, the, physically. It's yes. only 100 yards. I know, but, but, but the, it the might be 100,000 miles. <laughs> the notion so that this is when difficult I is called Congressman Rod, don't know. Yes, and <laughs> I had really the help of my colleague, my male colleague. So it's not always girls mm -hmm. versus boys here. And we just said, well, he said, will you come over? And I said, absolutely. Senator Shelby and I each went over, one staff person, no TV, no micro press and so on. And we began our conversation. And again, we established three working rules, absolute civility, that we would negotiate directly with each other through the press and that we would try to seek where we could common ground. And if we couldn't, that was okay, too. Well, we were able to move an appropriations bill when it hadn't been moved for years. Mm. For so. years. And I believe, for example, Senator uh, Stabenow moved the agricultural bill. You know, we actually will go to the states of our Republican chairman or vice chairman. Senator Shelby was my chairman on appropriations on the Commerce Justice Bill, I went to Alabama and saw what he wanted to do in the space program and how he was trying to help the people of Alabama. You know, he wants jobs. He wants to lift the minority community. We worked together on that. The fact that we would just go mm -hmm. and listen to what they were listening to uh, in and of itself was helpful. Debbie got on a plane. She went you know, to Kansas, and I, I could give other examples. I'm not so sure people do that anymore. And as you said, Koki, it is old school. But what it means is involve yourself mm -hmm. and listen to the member. And if they say, can you at least know where I'm coming from, the answer should be yes. Not that you're going to capitulate. We ask no one to capitulate but that you do engage in a and give and take. And you have a broader view of what's going on in the country that way. So that they, they, they can be just little things in, in, the, in a piece of legislation that can make all the difference in the yes. world. And, yes. And that's not capitulating. That's just making it sensible. Yes. You talk about being a force, not a caucus. And one of the stories I do love is when you and uh, Susan Collins got together to, um, because you needed to make sure some Medicare cuts did not happen. You were hearing from elderly people in your states and worrying oh, about them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, um, and it was about to be adjournment time. 
and you had promised you'd filibuster and then discovered you can't filibuster a motion to adjourn. So tell, tell us what you did. Well, first of all, Senator Collins and I, uh, Senator Collins is from Maine, uh, and I have constituents in Maryland in a Appalachian part of my state, the Mountain Counties, where we have like home health nurses visiting constituents on snowmobiles. It is a very rugged terrain. And we worry about our constituents at home, elderly and frail, who were isolated. They need those nurses. And guess what? Those nurses should be paid, and we shouldn't be off running around the country raising money and, you know, drinking wine and eating brie and telling everybody how terrific we were. So Susan and I were ready to really go to the floor. <laughs> And uh, we should point out she's a Republican. Yes, absolutely. And um, uh, we said we can't go home. So we went as a group. Susan organized her group and I. We went right to the leadership and we actually circulated a petition that we cannot go home. We challenged the leadership and we said, even though we can't filibuster, we can sit in. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the crowd and they we had a whole other group standing behind us and they said we don't want to get in it too with you ladies <laughs> well why don't we bring up the amendment we can wait and we were able to move it forward but um it's a willingness to challenge you know procedure is meant to facilitate it's not meant to be an obstacle but we just couldn't go home but it's a challenge that was for a, for a cause that mattered a great deal to you, but that and to the people in your in your state. But it, but you did it in a way that that organized people, but was not obnoxious. No, and actually, people enjoyed it. <laughs> it absolutely, uh, it absolutely enjoyed it. One of the things that worries me is that because of the poisonous atmosphere, so much of the time here. Uh, is that it discourages women from running for office. And then that becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, that if you have women not running, then you don't have the civility that women bring. Do you see that as something that's worrisome? I think the whole toxic environment is discouraging to women and also to many young people. They say, why do I want to get into this? Right. You know, I can work in my own community at that nonprofit uh, really help Habitat. Sure, I'll, I'll work on the public policy, but listen, you know, I, I really don't want to deal with all that toxic uh, atmosphere. I think it is discouraging, and I think we have to change the toxic atmosphere, one of which I do believe. The other thing that's discouraging to many women is the fact of money domination in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the Supreme Court uh, ruling on Citizens United, where you can have unlimited funds coming really from secret sources that can spend money, not as a candidate, because as a candidate, we're highly regulated. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very discouraging. Um, and it, it's a topic that I think needs to be addressed. But for example, if I'm, you know, you're running for election, you have a Republican opponent or you have a democratic component. That's the American way. We're regulated on what we can accept and from whom we can expect ex accept it. I think that's fantastic. But then there's this new court ruling where they can invent groups to run negative ads against you, and you don't even know who the donors right. are. I think that's wrong. And, and people are being discouraged from that. And I think young people need to know that really what should count is grassroots turnout, where they do feel involved, and where they feel that involvement makes a difference. They're wondering about that. The, um, the thing, one thing that does worry me in addition to that is your departure, because you have been so much a force to uh, bring bring women together, to uh, to bring people together, but particularly for the women. I remember when, after the '92 election, when you started talking about the women of the Senate, there were finally more than oh, two yeah. of you. <laughs> and so, um, but you have really, you know, insisted to your your uh, colleagues, more junior colleagues, that they that this is important and that they show up. Is somebody going to fill that role after you leave? Uh, I believe so. I believe that this has become such a strong tradition 
And there will always be, I know the Republican women feel that it's been a very good thing to do, and I believe that the Democratic women will uh, do so as well. Uh, because one of the things that has happened in our institution is people don't have essentially neutral places mm -hmm. where they can get to know each other and just kind of relax and get to know each other as people about your family, about how you got into this, mm -hmm. why you stay in it, why do you think, uh, what, what motivates you, uh, because everybody thinks it's usually grand ambition. Most people come to politics because they want to make a difference, and they want to make a difference in their community for their constituents. And uh, I think we need places just to be able to do that. Right. We don't have many places. We spend a lot of time either doing our committee work when we break for lunch, we have caucuses where people talk at us on how we can meet, beat the other guy or gal. Uh, and then at night, we go to receptions or fundraise. Well, right. There you are. at least here, we have our get-togethers where we have three rules. No staff, no memos, no leaks. <laughs> and the fact that you've been able to keep those is pretty, pretty nice. remarkable. Yes, yes. You know, I read somewhere that you said uh, that history se tends to be um, written about wars and, and uh, big events, um, but not about social movements. And that when you look at social movements, you see women at the head of them. And uh, that that's really what, what creates change. Um, and it reminded me of a, something I had, had heard growing up that, that Oliver Wendell Holmes had said, which is that he said, you know, um, the, when the circus comes to town, now this is in th those days, right? The, the circus parade goes through town, and um, and the elephants march in the parade, and we're always in front of them are little boys from the neighborhood who are dancing in front, pretending to lead the parade, and he said. The elephants are the great social movements, and the little boys are the politicians of the day. <laughs> Holmes said that? Yes. I, well, so, i got to look that one up. So that's exactly what you're saying. Yes. Um, if you look at the great social movements of our country, of course we had a tremendous, uh, when you look at the, the founding of our country, the American Revolution, yes, it was you know, the men that were part of that. But remember, there was a whole group of women, right. like Abigail Adams, who also wrote her husband, John, while he was down there in Philadelphia, thinking great thoughts with Jefferson and Ben Franklin, right. and going off to the pub. pub. <laughs> she was running the farm and keeping the family going, and she wrote him a letter saying, don't forget the ladies, right. or we will ferment our own revolution. And that's so, but if you look at the great changes in our time, Yes, we've always had great leaders. Certainly if you look at civil rights in the last half of the 20th century, yes, there was the charismatic leadership of Dr. King. But then there was a little lady about my height named Rosa Parks, who when she sat down, the world stood up and helped trigger uh, the movement. And whether it's been abolition, suffrage, uh, civil rights, the women have always been there and also doing a lot of the follow-through. Right, the, 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 the actual toiling in the vineyard part. Yes. No. So you still have an appropriations um, process to get through here for this year, and then, um, but you're already seeing people running for your seat. That must be a funny feeling. I mean, does it make you feel like you're dead? No. <laughs> <laughs> It makes me feel <laughs> to believe in the resurrection and there's another life. Uh, the, the fact is, is that when I decided to retire uh, after 30 years in the Senate, I said I'm turning a page but not writing the final chapter. And I want to be involved in my community and in the country, uh, really around inspirational leadership. And one of the things that just as we've talked about social movements, in 2020, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote, suffrage. You know, there's a big movie out now right. about it on the, on the effort in England. I think we need a national commemoration of it. And to commemorate, what did it mean? What did us getting the vote mean in terms of us being able to hold more office, the influence we had on elective office, the women that then came to the fore 
uh, in other fields, law, politics, medicine, and the change that really came about in our society. I think it could be terrific and hopefully inspire the next generation to truly be involved. I'm afraid that the, the, just the demands of family life, the demands of being in political life were such that people are bailing out, and men are too, because they say, who needs it? You know, I can do good in my community, which, by the way, they can. Right. We want them doing that. But I, I want more want to see more people thinking about this. So are you going to lead us to that uh, centennial celebration? I'll be one of the people uh, speaking up, but what do you think about that? Oh, I think we absolutely have to do that. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. But in terms of, um, you know, the fact that I won't hold office anymore, uh, I believe there's a time when you have to move on and, um, and let people be able to move up. And I'd rather people say to me, well done, Barb, than, oh, my God, overdone, Barb. So, <laughs> Well, well done, Barb. Thank you very much for having this conversation with me. Thank you. Okay.